and it's a pleasure to introduce Helen, who is an artist based between um, Manchester and London, uh, and you might know that she curates the Birthrights collection, which is just over the road, isn't it? Yeah. Um, which, is, <coughs> which is work um, around childbirth, um, and has been involved in family uh, residency initiatives as well, so she's going to talk um, about all that. So, welcome, Helen. Thank you very much. Hi. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, my name is Helen Knowles. Um, I'm an artist and a curator. And um, the reason I'm talking to you today is because I went to um, Santa Fe um, to do a residency um, back in 2013. And it really came out of the combination of work between being a curator and, and the work that I was making. So I'll tell you a little bit about Birthrights. It's a collection of contemporary art on childbirth. We started in 2008 and collected, had started with five works following an exhibition which went from the Glasgow Science Centre to the Manchester Museum. And since then, we've got something like 65 works. We've got works by people like Judy Chicago. Um, we hold um, a competition for new works um, in Media City every two years. Um, we sometimes run performances. Uh, this is a piece of work by Liv Pennington. Um, it's called Private View. She um, basically um, set up in a nightclub and got women to pee on pregnancy tests and then put the pregnancy chest in a contraption which was then projected in the nightclub and she got a little quote from them. So. And so some of them didn't know they were pregnant, some of them did. So there's little quotes like, this could go either way. Um, Joe uh, betted me to do this, the beer was a bonus. There's all these different quotes and, you know, different outcomes. Um, this is a new piece of work that we've just been donated by an artist called Anna Cassis Broder. Um, it it's a 28, work, a 28 photographic prints. And it was um, shown originally um, at the Home Truth uh, Home Truths exhibition at the Photographers Gallery, and it toured around four venues. So this piece of work, which is called um, "Therese Crowning an Ecstatic Childbirth," um, is quite an incredible image, um, and it was actually for the original tour, and that was shown um, in Glasgow Science Centre. And when we put it up they asked us to um, take it down. And I was really interested why. Um, I mean, you can obviously probably got your own ideas, partly nudity, partly because she's confounding the idea of a birth that is painful. Um, <clears throat> and also because we live in an age that's like, there's a proliferation of pornography, and so people look at this image and they're actually I think quite confused by it. Um, so it did, it did go up in the end, but it was met, put in a specific, you know, it was put in a much more, um, less public place. And when it came to the collection, um, the university actually asked us to put it in a locked room, first of all. And this is, our, so the collection is in the midwife's, you know, around the offices. Um, but eventually it came out onto the corridor, and now it does sit in the corridor. So that's the collection. Now, um, in terms of my own work, um, it was that piece of work that I found really interesting. It was like, why is certain images so powerful that they cause this kind of reaction? And what does it tell you about our culture? And I started to look online, and there was hundreds of thousands of birth images, uh, birth videos um, that I found. A lot of them were censored. Um, and what I did was I created a series of prints where I took screen grabs of the point when the baby crowns and made really large um, screen prints. They're four colour um, and they're all different. For instance, this woman gives birth in the garden. This woman gives birth in the bath. Again in the bath. This is a detail. So they're very pixelated because obviously the source material comes from YouTube. Um, and that's actually what the prints look like. They're really large. And that was a show in um, London um, at GV Art. 
Um, it caused quite a lot of consternation in the neighbourhood because um, it was quite posh, it was in Marlebone. And um, at one point, the uh, guy who runs the gallery, um, you know, some woman poked her head around and she said, how dare you put this up, this is a family area. And he was like, oh, it is a birth, but anyway. So, <clears throat> this takes me to um, New Mexico. Um, so what I was interested in doing was working with Native American women um, to see, it, the project was called Birth Online, Birth Offline. And it was basically, obviously uh, Native American women have strong uh, traditions, traditional traditions and ceremonies around birth. And I was interested in um, what they thought about the online video sharing. So I actually went out to New Mexico. Um, it was a family residency. Uh, that's a little image of, it's a very incredible landscape, um, you know, it's the desert. So uh, this is actually the car park, but it's a, it was an amazing building and it was their first family residency that they had ever done and there were five artists and we all brought our kids. And um, it was brilliant, we got like the loan of a car um, we took turns in driving our kids to um, to the summer school that they'd set up. So, like during, like so, we were there for a month, and um, those are my two kids at the end there. But you know, there was like all the kids from Santa Fe go to this summer school, and we kind of like between all the people at the residency took turns in driving all of our kids there, and they loved it. So, and this was a, actually, and in return, actually, I did a workshop um, where, you know, I did these large scale drawings with the kids. So. And those are some of the kids, some of well, my kids and the other kids from the residency. That's in the space. And the actual um, building is like this incredible kind of modernist building. Um, and you have really, I mean, it's America, so you've got like these huge studios, probably half the size of this room each, it's quite ridiculous. Um, and yeah, it was just, it was a really incredible experience. So this is um, Nicole Gonzalez, who is a Native American midwife. Um, she's Navajo. And uh, I met with her, it was very difficult, I have to say. So I went out thinking that, well, not thinking that it was gonna be easy, but I didn't realize how challenging it might be to try and work with the indigenous population and um, <clears throat> I've made contact with Nicole um, you know and she was really kind and we met up with her and she talked to us and then she invited us to a peyote ceremony right which is basically um, how the Native American uh, midwives exchange knowledge about birth and I didn't realize how privileged we were actually to be invited um, and so it was, it was, I mean, it's very difficult to actually describe this, like people talk about native time. There is something that happens when you're in these regions, which is not of this world. And, um, so anyway, basically we did end up going to this peyote ceremony. And when we got there, we drove half, about five hours across to Colorado and I, we actually took some guys who were with us because my boyfriend was with us and we should, probably shouldn't have. That was the big uh, kind of mistake that we made because it was for women. And like, I mean, I've worked with midwives for years, but you know, it's, I suppose it's this thing about understanding people's culture. And I think that was what's really interesting about this residency. And you know, one month is not enough, basically. Um, you know, it takes years for this sort of thing. So it was a big kind of learning experience. Um, and we rocked up at the, um, you know, at the coyote ceremony. And, well, I don't know, how, how long have we got? I've, yeah, I've, I've, uh, I'm gonna play you the, um, the piece that I wrote about this because I don't really know how to describe it other than just play you this. And it is 15 minutes, so I'm, I hope it doesn't, I hope it's not too long, but I think it will kind of illuminate. Um, well, how do I do this? So, Sentimos 
forest fires and the gathering had been moved. Then pandemonium followed, and somehow our group ballooned to include Ivan and Joe and this guy called Kenny. I met Kenny the night before properly as we got talking about how midwives were the women who knew the healing arts and that he wanted to go to Central America to learn from these indigenous midwives. So I invited him to come. Kenny is a small blonde guy from Colorado. Brought up on his grandparents' farm outside Boulder, he is clever and likes to watch and observe from the side. So in between looking up road closures on the internet, a summer solstice ceremony where Muna commandeered the population of Snow Mansion to throw seeds into a newly tilled field, whilst making a wish and dispelling old worries, our group formed. And now we are back on the road north towards Colorado, cutting through the huge plain to Fort Garland and slipping between two forest fires into the Rocky Mountains. I was disappointed Nicole did not decide to come. It would have been a good opportunity to get to know her a little, but I also have a feeling that she felt that the Spanish influence of the Corundera was not exactly her interest. I have a feeling that the Pueblos are extremely closed, but the problem lies in that the Corundera have kept hold of their traditions, and it seems like the Pueblos have lost them. We arrive at the newly rescheduled site, only to find that we are driving back to the original house. The forest fires have ceased, so in convoy of about 20 midwives in four-wheel drive jeeps, we are headed to Maria de la Cruz's 40 acres in Colorado. On arrival, we are struck by a group of about 20 hippies sat under a tree in the shade, some playing guitar, others just looking pretty phased. There is this ramshackle house with an open door. Hauling a sack of potatoes, we try to find Maria, and then a small native guy with an open face introduces himself as Maria's ex. Since the fires threatened an exodus, the midwives made their way over to his place, and now we are going to return. We're a funny looking crew, pretty white looking. We feel out of place, but Larry takes us up the hill, and the sun is burning, and there is this circular pagoda structure which casts a thin black shadow on the ground in one continuous circle, with a diameter the length of a tennis court, rather like a large circus ring on a hill, and in the centre is this tree adorned with tobacco pouches made from coloured material and some kind of bundle of sacred sticks and feathers perched high up. And as we enter the ring, we hold our hands to the sky and turn around, and everyone does this. Of course, before this happens, Chris, the doctor who jumped in with us, he is a paediatrician and wanted to ditch his group to come and meet the midwives, accidentally crosses the shadow line, but Larry is forgiven. He jokes about our colonial stamps on our passports. And then he explains the whole sun ceremony, the four days of fasting, the moon hut, where menstruating women sit, how 35 men will dance and pierce themselves to purify, to give back, and the families sit around and there is a lot of emotion. And he says we could come to a ceremony if we wanted. The sun dance was outlawed in the late 1900s until the 1950s. I get the impression that from a Western point of view, it was considered brutal, but I would say no more brutal than an unnecessary caesarean or plastic surgery. It is about purification, a trance, to find or receive a vision, which of course I'm sure you would receive if you fasted and danced for four days. And then we spoke with the first group of midwives who made us aware of our cultural difference and the need to be respectful. She let us come and join the herbalist workshop. This was a woman in her 60s, a white woman from Taos, with an audience of indigenous midwives. And after a workshop, and we had had the chance to introduce ourselves, she came right up to me with her card exclaiming, Back in the 60s, you know, in Taos, we were light years ahead of the natives. Quite a statement, not one I myself would have voiced. Written four days later. Dreams and memories filter in between my present reflections of the weekend, a heart made of burning coals, its gleaming undulations of red light shaped by Kenny, the apprentice fire chief. Pulsating vortex of the ceremonial space. Our arrival at Maria and Danny's home, jeeps parked in the front, the midwife who sponsored the gathering, baby on her hip, strong features, long nose, slender body, tattooed, an undercurrent of tension, visible mustering of strength to address us all, address us. You must take care to be respectful, to take your trash with you. We enter the kitchen, myself and Samantha, we begin to help sorting out the food. Vegetables on one table, another Maria from LA, a union leader, placing a task in front of each woman to chop, to stir, to crack eggs, to wash, to dry. Swiftly and gently orchestrating the preparation of the food, I slip outside. 
Dali expresses his reticence at putting up the teepee, but now with the help of the guys who he brought, he feels there is enough of them for this job. They disappear off up the hillside. Plumes of smoke from the forest fire change the appearance of the skyline, sometimes a heavy grey. Other times, white buffering clouds. Evidence of the fire stretches like black stalactites against the sky, a ratchet graveyard of tree trunks. I return to the kitchen, and I'm approached by another midwife looking like a Mayan princess, squat and proud, composed and retaining her power in decisive moments. She hands me an iPhone with Nicole's number tapped in. Nicole wants you to call her, eventually pacing up and down the perimeter of the field using Joe's phone I get through. Nicole is panicked. She blurts out the words, the midwives feel unhappy with you being there. They feel uncomfortable with your presence. I'm shocked. I ask Nicole, what should I do? You need to ask their permission to stay. I close the phone up like snapping together an oyster shell. I walk straight back into the kitchen and ask the main princess if she will talk with me, here or in private. And she leads me to the sitting room. My skin is prickling, my chest is on fire. I try to explain how we all came to be there at that place about the project. The main princess listens regally, expressing no emotion, her hair tied up above her chiselled face. How many of you are there? I stumble for the words, me, Samantha, Ivan and Joe, who drove us because we only have one car between us, and then there is Kenny and the doctor. I feel stupid, incapable of an explanation. I don't even know the doctor. She looks at me disdainfully, and then I try to tell her what I am interested in, about power relations, about the blog, about the exhibition. I've already sent through an email about what we were doing. We were meant to come with Nicole, but she let us down at the last minute. We waited with all our bags packed, it was a rushed decision, we had no idea. Maria and Danny, whose land it is, want you to stay. The women feel unhappy because of what we call historic trauma, but the sponsor is happy for you to stay. And then the sponsor converses in Spanish with the princess. My mind is reeling, I feel on the edge of tears. I dash out of the kitchen to the field, where Joe hands me the phone. I want you to leave, Nicole's voice breaks through, but I've asked permission and I feel it would be wrong to leave now. The family whose land it is would like us to stay. They were being polite, that is native way. Nicole, if we leave now, it will be worse. It will be bad for everyone. It will cause a scar. You don't understand my culture, Nicole blurts out. You'll never understand my culture. How will I ever understand unless I have the chance to engage with your culture? The line is breaking up. I pace along the edge, grasshoppers jump at my feet, and we talk or try to respond to the half-heard sentences. I close the phone. I walk to where Ivan and Joe and Kenny and the doctor and Danny are congregating at the foot of the field. Danny is relaxed in his Ray-Ban sunglasses, his soft voice like a balm. I explain what has happened. I explain how we have let down Nicole. So, she is unhappy. You're here now. Forget it. Tears start to flow as I look across the horizon and I gulp them back. Back in the kitchen, things are like a dream world. I answer questions, but I feel stung and disorientated. And then Maria, the union leader, tells us about historic trauma. Tears are now welling up in her eyes. One night, she drove into the wrong hotel. How, after checking in, she was parking her car, and a woman runs out of the hotel, clutching her baby, agitated, stating, You've got to go. You need to leave. I'm a God-fearing woman, but something bad will happen. And Maria had to drive three hours back to another service station to get away. The women gather on the stairs which lead into the kitchen. The Mayan princess has refused to introduce herself. The women gather around her protectively and we help chop. I feel so uncomfortable that I envision peeling away my skin and disintegrating like the Wicked Witch of the West in The Wizard of Oz. And we try to sit in the front deck and in the distance all the men are erect in the teepee far away from the current trauma. But my instinct is to stay to see this through, strange thoughts flip through my mind as I try to assemble the tent for a second time. Samantha wants to leave, Joe wants to leave, what if it gets ugly? I just need to trust it won't. Now Samantha is sat in the car and she looks upset and warm. I talk to Maria who owns the house. She has this sensible, practical air about it. No, you must stay. She makes a passing comment about how some of the younger women are being more militant. She says she'll phone Nicole. Maria is older. There are laughter lines around her eyes, yet she has the look of experience, her long dark hair and beaded earrings. She looks like how you would imagine a native woman to look. Long skirts, moccasins. It is Samantha whom I am worried about. 
and Maria rushes over to her, hugs her and exclaims, it's okay, this is my house, and we eat together, a prayer is said in four directions. And then all the women make their way over to the teepee, where, in a circle, woman after woman tells a story, utters sadness that moves everyone to tears. Not a single woman is left with a dry eye. The emotionless and openness is moving beyond belief. Stories of abuse, loss, discovery, anger. It could be a counselling meeting back in the UK, but it is also incomparable. It shifts the energy, acts as a release for the tension. Only the main princess remains missing. I try to communicate to the women how I appreciate and respect that the younger women who have not had children are there. How important it is to work on the blockages, the fears that may, unless approached and dealt with, cause problems in birth which affect the children as they grow. That is what is so priceless about the circle, the generations of women talking together. A fire is lit in a teepee by Danny and his niece. Afterwards, Samantha is upset. She sat in the back seat of the car, tears streaming down her face. It brought back the feeling she had around her mother's miscarriage and feeling like she was a replacement. And when I exit the teepee, the sky looks magnificent, but behind us, black smoke fills the sky. And the niece tells how she had watched the fire service drop water bombs on the horizon. Danny rushes past. You're going to join the ceremony. If that's okay, I reply. Yes, all of you. Muna sent a bag with Kenny for me to use during the ceremony. A feather fan, a cushion, a skirt, two blankets. I share them out. I take a seat. And Ivan sits next to me. Joe and Samantha beside Ivan. Kenny has been asked to be the fire chief. He sits by the door. The doctor sits on the other side of the teepee beside Maria, the union leader. I want to disperse our group, but no one else wants this. The teepee fills up, and finally in walks the main princess. She formally shakes hands with everyone in the circle, efficiently and without emotion. We are then asked to move, to make way for some children, so in unison we shift to another spot, and I sit next to a woman from L.A. She's scantily dressed, buxom and very warm and funny, a homegirl. Danny asks if she has a skirt. She has a large piece of material which she wraps herself in. Maria and her husband take a seat opposite the door. The fire is set to blaze by Kenny. Logs point towards the centre and are stacked up, resting one on top of the other like Jenga. Flames leap and shed light on a circle. The hot ashes have been swept to resemble the moon. The glowing orb, the woman and Danny begins. His members of his family sit around the circle. His daughters, Maria, Maria's son from her first marriage, Nieces, nephews and midwives line the edges of the teepee. Danny talks for a long time, every few minutes directing Kenny. More logs, pile them this way, shed more light, shift the hot coals into the moon so the fire can breathe. Everything has its place, its symbol, its meaning. And for Kenny, we see how he has been set to work. His face is red like a blacksmith's. He has to observe the correct direction in which to navigate the circle, always clockwise, sweeping, stacking, shaping, tending. Maria talks sometimes, but it is Danny who chiefly is running the ceremony. And there is a chance to speak at intervals. Things merge, prayers and utterances elongate. Danny asks for the medicine to be brought in in three pots, the mush, the tea and the water. He looks gleeful. It is passed around the circle, a teaspoon at a time. Its bitter taste moves through my body, acrid and burning, but cooling. Danny thanks everyone for being there, including us, whom he calls the upstarts. There is a peace which reverberates, incantations, blessings, conversations as the fire peaks and dips. Sometimes smoke fills the teepee so thickly we all cover our faces. Coals are cleared and a star is made from the orb and an orb into a heart and time is liquid. People around the circle throw up to get well. I keep expecting this will happen to me. Cedar is heaped on the fire each time someone gets well to purify the air. Care is taken not to come between the fire and the sickness. I begin to feel tired, and all the time songs are sung, a drum and a stick passed around to each singer. No one lies down. Everyone is alert and upright, despite feeling so tired, and more than seven hours Kenny tends the fire, not that anyone has any idea of the time. The connection between the family reminds me of the sweat lodge, the way Ramon celebrates his children, thanks them and displays his love for them. Danny, Maria and their family do the same. Sometimes tears are shed and moments are tender. I try to imagine my family interacting in this way. Ivan and I are now always propping each other up. It is hard to sit cross-legged for so long until eventually it's time to leave. And it's still dark outside and the moon has just disappeared behind the hill. 
and the birds are singing in the valley and it is so peaceful and clear and beautiful and everyone says good morning to each other. Samantha and myself go to the roundhouse to climb into our sleeping bags and fall fast asleep. So, I suppose what I'm just trying to say is that the thing about a residency is it's not, it's not kind of straightforward and it can really teach you a lot about yourself. Um, and you know, you can have a million plans in the world and they don't work out. But I think I did get an incredible amount from that experience. Um, so I don't know, is there any, I don't know if there's anything else. Does that, is there anything that anybody wants to ask about? Um, did, um, did doing the residency and that experience, which was amazing to listen to, um, influence um, your subsequent artwork? Did it feed in in some way? Other than that, as the, the sound piece in itself? Yeah, um, I haven't actually, the thing is, it's such a difficult subject that I haven't really felt like going there. Um, and it's all about representation and who can speak for who. And, you know, even playing this to you guys, is that right? I don't know. You know, you know but we're not meant, you're not meant to share this. You know, you can't take photographs in these ceremonies, right? So, it's, for me, because my work always deals with, like, politics, issues around representation, appropriation, whether it's right to appropriate images. Like the Ida Mae Gaskin image, that's an image that's appropriated from, um, by an artist from Ida Mae Gaskin, right? Um, and people do it all the time, and, and currently I'm doing an MFA at Goldsmith, and um, there's been a huge row because um, it's very international, the course, and uh, there's um, a woman, a uh, black woman from um, Durham, who's very political, and um, someone's just staged a very trendy photo shoot about um, where they got everyone to dress up in red, and it was like gangster style. And she completely, you know, you know, because America, also she's American, and America has this, it's so huge, the baggage of race and, you know, it's so different from here. And so, anyway, so there's like all, for me, it's just always about this question and, you know, where, you know, who speaks for who. And so I can't say at the moment I haven't made a piece of work specifically about it, but it's always feeding into my work. So, yeah. Yeah, do you want the mic? Um, no, it's okay. okay. I've got a loud voice. Hopefully, you can hear me. Um, just. If you could just say something about the process of your kind of getting these residencies. I mean, um, you haven't been, I mean, maybe it was implicit in what you were saying and I just haven't picked up yeah. on it, but just, if you could just give us some hints or clues as to how you went about, because from previous speakers, I've got the sense that it's through sort of informal contacts or people they've sort of met through their work or yeah I have to say that I mean like going out and meeting people is really the only way that you get things actually I think and so if, if one struggles with that is yeah. there another way around that Oh God, in your mean. experience I think or just not. you know talking to people. Yeah. I don't mean like networking in a sort of no. just talking to people about your work and like because it's always about putting a name to a face and so I mean the funny thing is the reason why I ended up going to New Mexico was because I actually went to interview Judy Chicago when she donated this piece to the collection so that's why I ended up there the first time and I went to the Santa Fe Arts Institute just randomly to look at it and they said, oh, we're going to do a family residency. And I was like, oh, really? You know, and so, and then I applied, you know, but I'd been there and my, you know, I don't know if I'd have got it if I hadn't have actually been there. I'm not saying this is always the case because there's sometimes people's talent and everything wins through, you know, but I do think there's a lot to be said for just going out and talking to people, you know, and that's how, you know, People just like knowing people, don't they? And it's not, 
I don't think it's nepotism, I think it's just a very human kind of thing about making contact. Any more specific questions for Helen, otherwise we can go into the sort of broader panel session. But can we thank you very much indeed. Thank you.